Thank you so much for your words and uh, to everyone who has shared themselves today. And thank you all for staying here through the end. A couple years ago, um, I was closing up the bar that I worked at. It was a music venue, and my oldest son was there. Uh, he was 18 at the time, and he, had, he, he came to listen to the music that was playing. Uh, he was helping me line the trash cans, and I was like, you know, I really hope when you grow up that if you decide to not have children, which is a legitimate choice, that might be something you decide, if you decide that, that it's because you feel like the work that you're doing doesn't lend itself to having a family or you're so devoted to your art or your craft or whatever it is that um, you don't feel like you could give yourself entirely to your family. And that it's not for a negative reason, like the chaos that we have at home. It's chaos because I have seven children. He was like, Mom, stop, put that down. I was like, what? He's like, don't you get it? I was like, get what? He's like, when your grandkids and your great grandkids are thriving and they are wildly happy, it's because of you. Because you decided to break the chain and you decided to live a better life, a life that embraced love and difficult discussions, and that you taught us to lean in to who we are and to learn healthful interdependence. That becomes all the more significant when you learn that from the time that I was 15 until the time that I was 20 years old, I was a neo-Nazi white power skinhead. The twisted, broken needs of a young life of trauma uh, led me to a place where the only way that I felt any type of empowerment was through uh, hate-filled uh, beliefs and ideology. One of the people that I met during my time as a neo-Nazi white supremacist was uh, a young man who took me in when I went on a trip to Chicago with my boyfriend at the time, whose mother would not let me in the house once I got there from Georgia. This young man lived in the basement apartment of his parents' house, and he said, why don't you come live, why don't you just come stay with me? Where I stayed until I got picked up by the police for being a runaway, put on a plane, and sent back home to just start the cycle all over again to fight with my parents and leave and go find some new echo chamber to live in where I wouldn't have to be challenged about my ideas about myself and about other people. A couple years ago, this young man, who's now a middle-aged man, like I'm a middle-aged woman, uh, our paths crossed again. And I was like, do you remember me? He's like, yeah, I remember you. He's like, hey, we're doing this work and we're, we're trying to you know, help take people out of lives of hate, and we're trying to help people who have lived those lives of hate-filled ideologies and help them heal and gain meaning and purpose in their lives. Do you want to come help us? I was like, Heck yeah, I do. So now, maybe three years later, uh, I, he and I work together um, and travel all over the world, anywhere where we are invited to use our voices to uh, help people understand and believe genuinely that even the worst people can fundamentally change who they are and that we can't lose hope even when things seem totally hopeless because our future depends on hanging on to the hope that we can all as a nation fundamentally change from a place of violence to a place of acceptance and equity and true diversity. It is my extreme honor and privilege to introduce to you Christian Picciolini. Uh, thank you, Pierce, and everybody else on the Listen First team, and, and thank you to you for coming and sitting through a full day uh, where it's 20 degrees warmer in the sun and you've decided to sit here. 
and I also want to thank the people who chose not to come today because I know that they're using their tools in other ways to get to the same place that we want to get to. And even though we don't have exact recipes on how to fix things, we're all committed in bringing equity, not only to this community, but to our country. And I'd like to thank them for that. I want to start by quoting one of my favorite songs because I don't think that the lyrics have ever been more true. Maybe you'll recognize it, and maybe you won't. Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around us have grown and accept it that soon we'll be drenched to the bone. And if our time to us is worth saving, then we better start swimming or we'll sink like a stone for the times they are a-changin'. I know a little bit about change. 30 years ago, I went from a normal teenage 14-year-old to one of America's first neo-Nazi skinheads, where I spent eight years of my life, almost every one of my formative years, dealing with my own self-loathing by projecting that pain onto other people so that I could selfishly not deal with it myself. I've since left, it's been 23 years since I've denounced my racism and have been working to pull people out of the same movement that I helped build 30 years ago. And I'm only able to do this work because when I look at people who say ugly things and do ugly things, I can see the broken child in them. I can see the broken 14-year-old that I was. And I understand that if we want to help people disengage from hate and get to the same place where we live, that we need to treat the child and not the monster. It's a natural instinct to be angry in the face of ugly words and even uglier actions, and I feel it myself. Every day I sit across from somebody who I think is wrong, whose words hurt me, but I listen. And I listen more than I speak. And I listen for what I call potholes, those things in life that we all encounter on a very fundamental search for our own identity, community, and purpose. And I understand that those potholes exist for people who can't navigate them or who don't have the support, or the will, or who are burdened by trauma that has gone unresolved. And my job, and my mission, is to fill in those potholes. And when I listen, I hear trauma. I hear about abuse and joblessness. And I also hear about neglect and extreme privilege. And it's those types of things that if we cannot get a grasp on them, if we cannot find the support we need, that often detours us down a very dark path. Since I've started this work, I've helped over 100 people disengage from hate groups and hateful ideologies. And I can tell you that I don't do that by arguing with them. I don't tell them that they're wrong. I don't debate them. I want to, but I don't. Instead, I listen. Because I know that being angry and debating and telling somebody that they're wrong without listening to them pushes them further away. My goal is to bring people in closer and embrace them, no matter how ugly they may seem. Because I understand that compassion and empathy are the strongest things that we can do to combat any problem that we're facing. The ability to put ourselves into somebody else's shoes to understand their pain, and the willingness to be vulnerable ourselves 
is often our greatest strength. I'm not gonna talk for the whole 10 minutes because this is called Listen First, and I wanna be able to listen to what you have to say. But I would like to leave you with a challenge. When you leave here today, understand that the people that we are talking about who are unwilling to listen to us, or maybe we're unwilling to listen to because of what they say, if we work in reverse and try to understand where they went off track, I can tell you from experience it's always about alienation and trauma. If we pull people in and we listen, eventually the ugly words stop and the vulnerability comes in. And I say this from experience because I have worked with some of the ugliest people who say the ugliest things, and I've seen some of the most beautiful things emerge from those connections. I'm really grateful for the opportunity that I was given 23 years ago when I left. But I also want to acknowledge the privilege that I have because I know that there are people of color who are not given the same opportunity as I was. We're all broken. We're all dealing with something that nobody else knows about. And the only way we're gonna be pulled out of those potholes that we all encounter is to listen and to grab the hand of the person who's asking to help you. I'd like to leave you with this challenge. Go out there and find somebody who you think is undeserving of your compassion and your empathy. And I'd like you to muster the courage to give it to them because I guarantee you they are the ones who need it the most. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you.